When Zarathustra came out of his ten years of total isolation from the world, he first praised the sun. Then on his way down the mountain, he came across an old saint who looked for roots, but he found none. Zarathustra says he loves mankind and comes down to bring a gift to them. But the old saint mocks him, telling him it is better to love God and give his gifts unto him and not mankind. He says that the one should not love beings that are so imperfect, but only the being above, who created all things and is perfect. So the old saint is out to praise God in the forest, away from all mankind. Zarathustra laughs with the man, but then says to himself as he walks away, Could it be possible this old saint in his forest has not yet heard of it, that God is dead? In like manner, when I come across many religious folks and hear them speak praises of an invisible God who has no face and cannot be possibly seen or heard by anyone, I think the same as Zarathustra in my heart. Know you not that you worship nothing, that your sacraments and rituals have lost all meaning? Know you not that God is dead? And when the madman from the gay science lit a lantern and ran into the marketplace, asking if anyone had seen God, he was mocked and ridiculed. But these were not religious folk, but rather modernists who no longer believed in God and attempted to push society beyond him. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost? asked one. Did he lose his way like a child? asked another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage? Immigrated? Thus they yelled and laughed. To these he told, God is dead, and gave them a warning of nihilism. But indeed, when all were silent and confused, the madman was remorseful, saying, I have come too early. Note that when Nietzsche says God is dead, he is not referring to a literal death of a big man in the sky, but rather the death of meaning and truth. As our world increasingly moves away from God, we have replaced him with secular things, meaningless things. Man can't help but worship something, anything. God is dead in this world we have created. Nietzsche knew that this would bring about widespread nihilism, and with nihilism would come despair and abandonment of all morality. You may say that for now you can deal with the meaninglessness of life. You may say that the inevitability of the death of all things into oblivion makes life sweet at the moment. But the fact that nothing matters in the eternity is something we are all going to have to confront. As Nietzsche says, if you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. If you haven't gazed into the abyss yet, Nietzsche seems to suggest that there will be a worldwide cataclysmic nexus event that will force us to confront that God is dead in our modern society. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering, that has not yet reached the ears of men. Lightning and thunder require time, the light of the stars requires time, deeds though done still require time to be seen and heard. This deed is still more distant from them than the most distant stars, and yet they have done it to themselves. And the Doctrine and Covenants seems to hint similarly, for prophets all over the world have tried to warn us of pending nihilism and despair, just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. This modern world has left us weak, impatient, and standing on sand that will be easily washed away. The things you own end up owning you. For after prophet's testimony cometh the testimony of earthquakes, that shall cause groanings in the midst of her, and men shall fall upon the ground, and shall not be able to stand. And also cometh the testimony of the voice of thunderings, and the voice of lightnings, and the voice of tempests, and the voice of the waves of the sea, heaving themselves beyond their bounds. And all things shall be in commotion, and surely men's hearts shall fail them, for fear shall come upon all people. In the face of such terrible things, men and women everywhere, who are not sufficiently prepared, will have to make a choice, to stay true to morality or abandon it, and sadly, more will abandon it than stay true. And so it is for these reasons that I call Frederick Nietzsche a prophet. I see. It seems this Nietzsche was quite a profound thinker. Or perhaps he skipped right past profound and went straight to crazy instead. I would now like to further analyze these concepts through the anime series Death Note. 
Death Note opens with top of his class high school student Light Yagami, who is bored with the people around him and frustrated with the rotten world. Even as he has a textbook open that is talking about overpopulation, which leads to the destruction of forests and pollution to the increased in extinction rate of many species. He one day finds a notebook that was dropped by a Shinigami, a god of death, Ryuk. After reading the instructions, he finds that he has the power in his hands to kill off anyone he pleases by simply writing their name in the death note and picturing their face in his mind. He then takes it upon himself to rid the world of those he judges to be unredeemable criminals. He takes on the mantle of Kira, taken from the English word killer. Then, and only then, the world will start moving in the right direction. It'll be a new world, free of injustice and populated by people who I've judged to be honest, kind, and hardworking. And I... I will become the god of this new world. However, in the very next episode, he is confronted by his foil, L, a world-renowned detective who is determined to catch Light. L highlights problems with Light's philosophy and calls him evil. Each subsequent episode seems to be what would happen if Alfred Hitchcock ever made an anime, as we get a thrilling cat and mouse chase. Wherever Light turns, L seems to be one step ahead of him. Right from the ending of episode 2, when L and Light shout in unison, I am, I am, justice. The entire show focuses on what justice means. Most media simply puts justice as meaning the good guys will always win, but death no complicates things. You may have heard of the quote attributed to Winston Churchill, history is written by the victors. In other words, justice may only be determined by whoever is in power. Therefore, in a world devoid of God, a supreme judge, it may be reasonable to suggest that justice is just a social construct made up to justify the victor's actions. Throughout Death Note, several characters talk about justice, but we never seem to get a clear definition as to what exactly justice means in this world. Near the end, Light, while pretending to want to catch himself, seems to sum up exactly what justice in this world means. If Kira gets caught, then that makes him evil. But if he wins and rules the world, then I guess he's justice. Justice to these characters is nothing more than a game, as in the end, when Light is caught, there is no talk of justice prevailing, but instead, they talk about winning and losing. More specifically, the show asks, What does justice mean when nobody's looking? From the Book of Mormon we read, Now if there was no law given, if a man murdered, he should die. Would he be afraid he would die if he should murder? And also, if there was no law given against sin, men would not be afraid to sin. Now this isn't to say that without God we would all be rapists and murderers, but it is simply a question of how easy it is to sin when there are no consequences involved. For this reason, violent video games are popular because you can kill without any real-world consequences. And while it is naive to say that without God we would all be rapists, pornography has made it so that we can rape and objectify people without anyone forcing us to consider what we have done. It all has to do with maintaining reputation. As Light tells us, Humans will always try to maintain appearances when they're in public. That's just how we are. But this is how they really feel. Most are too afraid to support me as they're worried about what others will think. Many would rather deny my existence. But on the internet, where you can remain anonymous, support for Kira is growing. From the Republic of Plato, we get a story in which a man finds a ring that makes him invisible. Afterward, he promptly rapes the queen, kills the king, and takes over the kingdom, all because he knew he could get away with it. But perhaps if we knew that there were universal laws, and that every action we took would either lead to our condemnation, or that we would be given great gifts. Only God can determine such things. The closest thing we could get to any kind of god in Death Note are the Shinigami, gods of death. However, unlike the Abrahamic god, these gods are fallible, bored, lazy, not all-knowing, not all-powerful, and have lost any reason for their existence. If they write humans' names in their death notes to extend their own lives, then they are only mocked for working so hard. Death Note is very clearly a world devoid of any supreme judge of the universe. When Light first gets the Death Note, he is told that he won't be punished for using it, as he will not go to heaven or hell when he dies. 
So then, you're saying I can use the Death Note all I want and I won't be punished? However, we later find out that this is a universal concept in the show, that without a supreme creator of the universe, a supreme judge, there is no reward or punishment after death. All humans shall cease to exist in the void. This void, that Light initially ignores, quickly catches up to him when he is forced to stare into the abyss. No one truly understands what it means to die until they are about to. Not knowing what happens after death is scary, and being unable to d understand what it means to cease to exist is even scarier. The closest that we can think of what non-existence could imply is when we are in the deepest part of sleep, but even then, we are still very conscious and can dream. Having lost to the police, and on the precipice of bleeding to death, Light pleads with Ryuk to kill the police instead of him, as he screams and cries, I don't want to die! So in a world devoid of God, there is no heaven or hell. No matter what you do while you are alive, everybody goes to the same place once you die. Death is equal. Without any reward or punishment after death, is there any real justice or universal laws? Can little children who go their whole lives in starvation ever receive mercy? And if there is no justice or laws, then can we say if anything is right or wrong? Could there then be any redemption or mercy? Is there then any real universal truth? From the Book of Mormon's perspective, no. Therefore, according to justice, the plan of redemption cannot be brought about only on conditions of repentance of men in this probationary state, yea, this preparatory state. For except it were for these conditions, mercy could not take effect, except it should destroy the work of justice. Now the work of justice could not be destroyed. If so, God would cease to be God. And now the plan of mercy should not be brought about, except an atonement should be made. Therefore, God himself atoneth for the sins of the world to bring about the plan of mercy, to appease the demands of justice, that God might be a perfect, just God, and merciful God also. Now repentance could not come unto men, except there were a punishment, which also was eternal as the life of the soul should be a fixed opposite to the plan of happiness, which was as eternal also as the life of the soul. Now how could a man repent except he should sin? How could he sin if there was no law? How could there be a law save there was a punishment? Ah, but the show Death Note seems to ask one more central question of far greater importance. What if God was an atheist? The question may seem absurd and crazy at first, but I want you to really think about this. That is to say, what if God never had any positive or negative consequences to his actions? Nothing exists without a purpose, and we cannot have a purpose unless our actions have certain consequences. It is the law itself that binds us to reality. It distinguishes right from wrong, gives us options, gives us focus. With no law, there is no breaking of the law, no consequences. So if God has no God, you are implying that he has no purpose. Indeed, Death Note shows us what such a god would be like. Light Yagami is an atheist, but he fashions himself a god. By killing off criminals all over the world, he also begins killing off anyone who thinks to defy him and catch him. He wants the world to know of his existence. He wants his will to be the only law in the entire world. While even his father is out to catch Kira, he keeps it all a secret from his own family, putting on an act for the world. He even fashions himself a martyr, or a Christ-like savior, who is sacrificing himself for the greater good of humanity, as he says, Even if it means sacrificing my own mind and soul, it's worth it, because the world can't go on like this. But what he is doing is anything but Christ-like. By killing all criminals, he makes himself evil. By cleaning up a rotten world, he would have to contend with a rotten self. His perfect world can only come about with millions of people being dead. All are sacrificial pawns. No one is safe, not even those closest to him. After several years, religions start popping up, like televangelists and secret cults dedicated to worshiping Kira, even long after he is dead. Many atheists have pondered what would happen if they died and met God? But I want to propose this interesting proposal, this scenario. Let's say that you are an atheist, or you worship a variant of God. 
You oppose the real God your whole life and never consider him to be real, but a fabric of humans' fanciful imagination. However, you also dedicate yourself to achieving great things for the benefit of all humanity. But you start to realize that the more you push yourself, the more no one will understand or even begin to appreciate all you do. You also desire to push your body beyond its limits to the point of becoming a perfectionist. But you run your body to the ground and realize that your goals are way too high. Many others mock you and often say you can't do it. As a result, you start to realize there is no justice for you. You realize how meaningless life is, until finally you die. Upon death, you meet God, and he is absolutely nothing like you imagined. He is a supreme being who is so far above you that it makes you feel that much more worthless. You are certain of your fate as you spiral into despair and you accept defeat. In one last effort to save yourself from hell, you attempt to be friends with God and see some of yourself in him. You even offer to wash God's feet, but like Skyron from Greek mythology, as you are washing God's feet, he will just kick you into hell. A similar fate befalls El, even as he attempts to be friends with Light, only to admit defeat and try to atone for trying to catch Kira by washing Light's feet. His high intellect made him the greatest detective, but few ever knew the real L, and even fewer knew his real name. It is fitting that Light would push a Shinigami named Ren, who could see L's real name, to kill L. Rem stands for Rapid Eye Movement, the deepest part of sleep. Kira punished him, L, for even defying God of the new world. Such a god who kills without mercy, without care for consequences, is not a god, but a very childish individual who hates to lose. Just what do you mean? Well, I'm also childish and I hate to lose. That's how I know. He is not all-knowing. He does not know your heart, but he punishes you nonetheless. I don't believe in this god, for this is not god. But there is mercy in this world. There is justice, truly without a shadow of a doubt, because there is a law. There is a God who lives by the law, even as he commands his children to live the law. He said we are his friends if we live the law. That is, we are even as he is, gods, if we live by the law. For by the law are gods made. But all have broken the law to some degree or another. Justice demands payment. Are you able to pay? No, you are not. For though we see your sins do not compare to the worst of humanity, compared to the majesty and unbelievable righteousness in God, the distinction between your sins and the murderer is near non-existent, as finity is nothing compared to infinity. And no unclean thing can dwell with God, because you would not feel worthy enough to be near him. You would tell him you don't belong there. Yet he wants you there. He knows your heart, your passions, your drive, and he still wants to dwell with you. For he wants you to see the print of the nails in his hands. He wants you to know he was wounded too. He feels your pain. His empathy for you is boundless. He stood between you and oblivion and took it full force. By integrating his shadow, you, you and he became equals, and he called you his friend. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He came as a man before us to show us love and compassion. He understands you, yet we killed him and drove nails into his hands because we did not understand him. So we crucified him, but he never stopped loving us. Why? He came not to save us from his wrath but to save us from ourselves. He came to redeem us. He came to show you your future self and what it is that is possible for you. Even so, we killed truth and meaning. We killed God. Eventually, we will have to confront nihilism in this world. When we are unable to immediately talk with God face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend, it is easy to think that there is no God. When you are alone, no one to watch or criticize you, what do you do? If faced with a meaningless universe, no consequences to face for any action, no one to scrutinize you, then your true self comes out to maintain morality or abandon it. But then, what does it matter if there is no universal law, as there is no difference between right and wrong? Then you should just close your eyes forever. But that is not your fate, for there is a God, there is an afterlife, there is justice, there is mercy. 
you have a partner above. He is your God, your friend, your brother. And with the Father, you are a son or daughter with divine potential. Though you stumbled hard and fell, he still loves you more than you deserve, far more. He wants to embrace you, though even as he embraces you, he bleeds. For embracing you, he feels your pain and atones for your sins. Your sins are like the needles of a porcupine, but God hugs you tightly nonetheless. Would you not then cry into his arms and wet his bosom with your tears? Therefore, you would not want to sin any more and are redeemed. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This is the God I believe in. This is the God I worship. To be as overly ambitious as you want and still receive justice and mercy in the end. What a plight. The entire human race in free fall. Every man, woman, and child in it physically tumbling toward permanent death, spiritually plunging toward eternal anguish. Is that what life was meant to be? Is this the grand finale of the human experience? Are we all just hanging in a cold canyon somewhere in an indifferent universe? Each of us searching for a toehold, each of us seeking, seeking for something to help, something to grip, with nothing but the feeling of sand sliding under our fingers. Nothing to save us, nothing to hold on to, much less anything to hold on to us. Is our only purpose in life an empty existential exercise, simply to leap as high as we can, hang on for our prescribed three score years and ten, and then fail, then fall, and keep falling forever? The answer to those questions is an unequivocal and eternal no. So today, we celebrate the gift of victory. Over every fall we've ever experienced, every sorrow we've ever known, every discouragement we've ever had, every fear we've ever faced, to say nothing of resurrection from death, and forgiveness for our sins. That victory is available to us because of events that transpired on a weekend precisely like this more than two millennia ago in Jerusalem. Beginning in the spiritual anguish of the Garden of Gethsemane, moving to the crucifixion on a cross at Calvary, and concluding on a beautiful Sunday morning inside a donated tomb, a sinless, pure, and holy man, the very Son of God himself, did what no other deceased person had ever done nor ever could do. Under his own power, he rose from death, never to have his body separated from his spirit again. Of his own volition, he shed the burial linen with which he had been bound, carefully putting the burial napkin that had been placed over his face in a place by itself, the scripture says. That first Easter sequence of atonement and resurrection constitutes the most consequential moment, the most generous gift, the most excruciating pain, and the most majestic manifestation of pure love ever to be demonstrated in the history of this world. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, suffered, died, 
and rose from death in order that he could, like lightning in a summer storm, grasp us as we fell, held us with his might, and through our obedience to his commandments, lift us to eternal life. How great, how glorious, how complete. Redemption's grand design. Where justice, love, and mercy meet in harmony divine. Thank you for watching. Please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps this channel. And remember to keep it righteous.